Thank you, Muriel. Is this on? It's a year on. Okay, thank you. So, okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you, Muriel, for that kind introduction, and thanks both of you, uh, Sean and Muriel, for organizing what looks like a really interesting day, uh, two days, and, uh, and for inviting me to be part of it. Uh, and uh, just uh, with that story about Joe Dube, I used to be at Illinois, too. I knew Joe, Joe Dube very well, very gentle man. I guess he didn't like Epsilontics. Uh, but there was another, we had another colleague in the math department, uh, Jacob Wolfowitz, who was a little crustier than Joe Dew. Did you overlap with, with Jake? I, did you overlap with Jake Wolfowitz? I can't remember. Okay, so he, uh, he came to Florida after Illinois. But anyway, um, he had another view on this. He, uh, his, his view of Shannon's work was uh, that it was poetry that the, uh, the theorems were right, but the proofs were wrong. So he, he probably did like epsilontics a little more than Dube did. So anyway, but I have no epsilontics in my talk today. Uh, I, I'm going to talk about, I, I, given the nature of this uh, workshop, I thought I would try to inject uh, three things into my talk. Uh, information theory, uh, control, not too much theory actually, uh, and game theory. Uh, and I'm going to talk about these three things in the context of uh, privacy in the smart grid. Uh, so I think I uh, probably don't need to motivate what the smart grid is. It's, uh, you know, the electricity, so the classical, hierarchical, centralized uh, electricity grid uh, is slowly, uh, but hopefully surely, being transformed into a cyber-physical system with um, uh, sensors, meters, so forth, controls, communication networks, uh, in order to allow for greater uh, endpoint participation, that is uh, demand side management, uh, and the integration of renewables, storage, and things of that sort, to make a more efficient, sustainable uh, energy distribution system. Uh, and th one of the issues that comes up, of course, anytime you start uh, thinking about uh, a cyber system is privacy. Uh, and so what I'm going to talk about first is a little bit is privacy, uh, and then I'll move into some particular problems coming up in that context in Smart Grid. Uh, this is joint work with a number of people. Um, all but one of these people is, uh, all but two of these people are former postdocs of mine at Princeton. Uh, Veronica is now at INSEA in Paris, Denise is at Imperial College, Shomo is at uh, Carnegie Mellon, Sohail is at uh, Minnesota. Uh, Raj is not a former postdoc, but he is actually married to a former postdoc, <laughs> Lalitha, who is at Arizona State. Uh, and Onor it was a student of uh, Denise. So that's who the people here who, who did most of this work. The Epsilontics are due to them. I'm not going to talk about those. Uh, but of course they're very important. Uh, here's the, the outline. First of all, I'll motivate it just a little bit more. Uh, then I'm going to uh, inject these three uh, areas into this problem. I'll, first of all, I'll talk about a general formalism for privacy uh, based on an information theoretic formulation. Uh, then I'm going to talk about smart meter privacy. And there I'll inject a little bit of control. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I'll talk about a, a, another a related problem of competitive privacy. And you can tell from the word competitive that here I'm going to introduce some game theory. Okay, so that's the, that's the program of the day. All right, so by way of motivation, um, you know, I, I think I already said this, uh, but, but let me just say it again, that, uh, you know, once you put a cyber layer in anything, uh, it's going to start generating electronic data, uh, and that data, is, a lot of it's going to be sensitive or private. So, you know, in the grid, there are, of course, smart meters, which are generating data about individual consumers. 
There's also sensors and PMUs that are generating data about what's happening in the grid. Okay. So, of course, the reason why this data exists is because it's, it's useful, but uh, it could also leak information okay, about things that should be kept private. Okay. So, to keep it private, of course, we could just store it somewhere in a vault. But the utility of the data depends on its accessibility. So there's a fundamental uh, dichotomy here, or a trade-off, between uh, privacy and utility of data. And this is true of any data source, not just uh, uh, smart grid data, but any data source has this uh, trade-off. Okay, so, so how can we characterize this fundamental trade-off? All right, so let me, uh, let me talk about that and put this in an information theoretic context. And this is work that appeared in the TIFS is the IEEE Transactions on Information, Forensics, and Security. All right, so we'll, uh, what I want to do is put this in the context of a database, but uh, the same principles can apply to other problems as we'll see later. So a database is just a table. It has uh, entries that are the, the rows, so an entry would be a an individual uh, who's, or something about an individual whose uh, uh, data is stored in the database. Uh, and the columns are attributes. So for example, in a, a medical database, an entry might be a patient or a patient visit. And the, the attributes would be things like uh, demographic data, uh, visit date, test run, diagnosis, treatment, and maybe results. Okay, and of course the way a database is used is a user of the database sends a query to the database and the database returns a response. And the data can be real numbers, categorical data, what have you. All right, so we can model the database uh, statistically by thinking of the rows as being independent and identically distributed. And um, the, uh, but, but the columns are going to be correlated, okay, or dependent, okay. So since the rows are entries, each entry is a different person or whatever, we could think about on a first order they're independent. Uh, but the columns are things that are quite correlated. For example, in that example I gave you before, certainly demographics relate to tests, diagnoses, and, and so forth, and response. So uh, we have a set of IID vectors. Uh, the vectors themselves are dependent with it from uh, component to component. Then we can divide those uh, attributes, the, that is the elements of these ve this, this vector, into two types, public and private. So the public ones can be revealed without any uh, concerns. The private ones should be kept hidden. Okay, and there could be overlap. So, for example, in a financial database, you might have your credit card number, which is 16 digits. Uh, that's certainly uh, private, but you might reveal the last four digits for various purposes. So, there could be some overlap. But even if there's not overlap, uh, you can see because of the correlation or the dependence between various attributes that even if there were not overlap here, re just strictly simply revealing the public da data can leak information about the private data. Okay, so there's a trade-off here even when you don't have this overlap, but just point out that there could be overlap. Okay, so now we have a mathematical setup here. So how can we characterize the trade-off between utility and privacy? Well, first of all, we can measure utility in terms of distortion of the public variables as they're revealed to a user of the database. So this is an inverse measure of utility. Low distortion means high utility. Okay. Um, and then we can measure privacy in a time-honored way in information theory uh, in terms of the equivocation of the private variables uh, in information revealed to a user. So equivocation, if you're not familiar with the term, just means the conditional entropy of the private variable. This means wh what we'd like to do is to measure privacy in terms of the, the, the conditional entropy of the private variables given, inf given whatever we reveal to a user. Okay. And we can also use other leakage measures and some of the examples later I will. So now we have a, a bona fide mathematical problem. We have an IID set of vectors. We have a distortion measure. We have equivocation. We'd like to find all the possible distortion equivocation pairs for that particular statistical model. Okay, so once we've determined that region, the boundary of it will give us the efficient frontier in this trade-off. 
Okay. Okay, so how can we do that? Well, uh, one way to do that, from my perspective, an easy way to do that is to convert this into a communications problem. Okay, so let's think about the database, which is just a big random matrix. Okay, uh, the re let's think about re the way we reveal it to a user is to first quantize it and then reveal a quantized version of the database to the user. Okay, so that introduces distortion, but it also allows us to perhaps uh, introduce a level of privacy. So we can call the, uh, the quantization points, if you will, say they're Im impossible quantized databases. We can, call the, we, we, we can call those sanitized databases. This is, just comes from the computer science literature on database privacy. Uh, they're sanitized because some information has been uh, removed from them. So now we have uh, this quantization or encoding going on, we, we really have a communications problem to look at now. We have a source, which is the database. It has two types of uh, elements, the revealed and the hidden. Uh, we're going to quantize it before we transmit it to a receiver, that is the user of the database, uh, in, oops, sorry, into uh, one of these um, sanitized databases. We're going to reveal that to the querier. Uh, and then the querier is really the decoder here, tries to reconstruct the reveal variables from whatever we reveal. We measure the uh, utility of that in terms of distortion. So we just set up a distortion metric, rho, and we would like to look at the average expected distortion uh, per entry. Uh, and we'd like that to be less than some amount d uh, plus epsilon, where we're going to let epsilon go to zero as n goes to infinity. I'm sorry, there is an epsilon to get in here. I forgot about it. I forgot about it. Sorry. It's not going to appear again. Well, one more time. One more time. Maybe twice. Okay. And we're going to measure equivocation. See, there's another one. Sorry. Uh, in terms of... <laughs> I lied. Uh, in terms of... Uh, we're going to measure privacy in terms of equivocation, which is just conditional entropy here of the hidden variables given, again, given the reveal. Okay? And we'd like on the average per um, entry for that to be greater than E, some amount E, and then minus epsilon, where epsilon is going to go to zero as N goes to infinity. Okay, so that's what we'd like to find. It turns out that it's easier to find this uh, Set of, so we'd like to find the set of achievable D and E as N goes to infinity, epsilon goes to zero. Okay. Now, it um, turns out that that's easier to do if we introduce a third variable, that is rate. That is, there's no real, in this database problem, there's no real uh, interest in rate unless we were thinking about the query or being over some capacity limited line. Uh, communicating over a capacity limited line. But we can introduce rate here for another reason. So the rate here is the the number of bits per query per uh, entry. Uh, and that, if we constrain the rate, we're just constraining the number of elements in the database, uh, in the uh, uh, set of quantized uh, databases. Okay. So now we have three things. We had two, and now we have three. It seems like a harder problem. But in fact, now we have an easier problem because this is now a classical problem in information theory. The trade off between rate and distortion is the rate distortion problem, classical, right? So we have a rate distortion problem with an equivocation constraint. That also is a some, somewhat classical problem studied by Yamamoto in the 80s, okay? So uh, he, Yamamoto's work was a much simpler model than this, but he set up the problem of looking at rate distortion uh, with an equivocation constraint, okay? So we have some machinery out there that we can apply to, to solve this problem now. So just, uh, what is this, sort of just to say a little bit about this problem, so just uh, graphically what have we got? We've got uh, three quantities, rate, equivocation, and distortion. For a given achievable distortion equivocation pair, we have a surface of rates, which are the minimal rates at which we can achieve that pair. So the rate distortion equivocation region is, a, is just everything that lies above this surface, right? And the projection of this surface on the distortion rate plane is the classical rate distortion function, uh, whereas the uh, projection down into the equivocation distortion plane is what we're interested in here, okay? So once we can, if we solve this problem, 
look at this projection, there's the uh, utility privacy trade-off region. Uh, of course, utility is going opposite of distortion. Uh, and the outer boundary is the efficient frontier. Okay, so that tells us what the optimal trade-off is here. And uh, so it doesn't tell us what to do, it just says that if we want to um, achieve a given level of privacy, we have to accept a certain amount of distortion. And this is the optimal. Okay, so that's the setup. Okay, so just to summarize this general formalism, um, we uh, looked at the database as an example of an information source. We, we thought about dividing the attributes into public and private ones. This leads to an equivocation distortion characterization. We added rate. That gave us a rate distortion problem with an equivocation constraint, which put it in the context of classical or at least established information theoretic analysis. Uh, just to mention, without, I'm not going to talk about these in detail, but there are other things we can look at in this context. For example, multiple queries. That is, if you query the database multiple times, it changes the, the trade-off. This is a problem of successive disclosure, which we can also analyze. We can also look at multiple sources with the same entries or that over overlap. So uh, this is a real big problem, uh, practical problem in databases is that multiple databases can be combined often to get at private information. Uh, and this we can look at as a problem of side information. So you have one database that you're looking at the trade-off of. There's another database over there that's really side information for the querier. It changes the, the trade-off region. And we can also look at other measures of privacy and utility. So there's a lot more you can do here. But what I want to do now is to move on and talk about uh, the, some applications of these ideas in uh, smart grid problems. And the first one I'm going to talk, talk about, question, Chris. Yeah. It's a workshop. No, no. You're going to make me work. So is the, can this stuff be blind in the sense? I mean, this, there may be things, there may be side information that you didn't really take account of. Yeah, that's a good problem. We haven't really looked at that, actually. Uh, but we, yeah, so you, there's the issue if you don't know what's out there. So may, maybe, you, uh, you know, one way to do that would be to think about a compound uh, site information source. But, but even at that, you sort of have to know the universe, right? So it's, it's hard to, it's like the, uh, I can't remember the infamous quote about the, the known knowns, the unknown unknowns, and the unknown unknowns. You can't do much about the unknown unknowns. The known unknowns you can, you can deal with. But that's, that's a great problem. Some kind of universal uh, thing which would, would deal. But of course, ultimately, if one of the, if, if site information is the database itself, if, if one of the possible elements of site information is the source itself, you're sunk, right? So there can't be a completely universal uh, answer. But that's a great, great question. And, and I think there's some nice epsilonics in, in that question, too. So that's for the coffee break or maybe the cocktail hour. So. OK, so now I want to talk about the, some application of these ideas in, in uh, Smart Grid. And the first one I'm going to talk about is smart meter privacy. And there are two papers here I want to refer you to. One is, again, with Lalitha. This is Raj and Sohel. This is a paper that appeared, this is uh, the IEEE transactions on smart grid, appeared uh, two years ago now. Uh, and this one, uh, this is owner Tan, this Denise is one of Denise's students. This appeared in uh, Muriel's journal in the smart grid communication series. <clears throat> okay. All right, so what is uh, smart meter privacy? Well, I think everyone probably knows what a smart meter is. A smart meter is basically a meter that, um, uh, re measures and reports your electricity usage uh, almost on a real-time basis. Typically it's 15 minutes or so, but let's just think about it being on a real-time basis. Uh, I don't know, do you have a lot in Florida? Is there a major penetration of smart meters? No. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, on the West Coast, there's a lot of this. In Europe, it's uh, very prevalent. I, mean, I think in Finland, it's 100%, for example. So this may be a bigger issue right now in Europe, but it's coming. Okay, uh, so basically, you know, it's useful data because you can use it to, the, 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 the utility can use it to uh, do spot pricing type things, uh, balance loads. Y you know, you can use it to uh, adjust your own uh, usage and so forth based on what's happening in real time. So it's useful data. On the other hand, it can, uh, 
leak information about what's happening inside your house because uh, this is this is a cartoon but a real if you look at a real smart meter trace it looks a lot like this it's just a little noisier uh, and you can see that if you uh, there, there, different things that you can turn on in your house, appliances of various sorts, have distinctive signatures. So you can look at a smart meter trace and do and infer what's happening inside the house. Okay, so there's a privacy issue. Okay. So here's a utility privacy trade-off problem. Uh, we can uh, set it up this way. One way to set it up. We can model uh, the trace as a hidden state. Gauss Markov process. The state is uh, the hidden state is either continuous or intermittent. So just note that they're going to be continuous things like your air conditioner or your refrigerator, and then they're going to be intermittent things like your coffee pot, toaster, and so forth that are going to be more informative about what's happening. That somebody's there actually doing things in the house uh, or not. Okay. So, uh, so that's, those are the hidden states, and the way we're going to, uh, in the beginning, I'm not going to, there's no control yet, folks. Uh, in the beginning, I'm going to talk about a, a source coding approach to this problem. Uh, so, the way we're going to uh, enact the trade off between uh, utility and, and privacy uh, is by encoding of the meter readings before they're transmitted to the utility. Uh, the trade-off is going to be the distortion of usage, so mean square distortion in this case, versus uh, information leakage about the intermittent state. That is, we don't really care if the, about the continuous state, we really care more about the intermittent state because that's what's informative. Okay. Uh, it turns out that, first of all, this is not a database problem, this is a time series problem, right? So you can see immediately this is different, but the framework is more or less the same. One can analyze this problem. That's what this paper here is about. Uh, and it turns out that we get a uh, uh, sort of classical solution to, to this problem. It's a basically reverse water filling, which is a rate minimizing source code for Gaussian sources. Okay, so what do we mean by reverse water filling? Well, first of all, we've got this. This is a stationary process. It has a power spectrum. And if we look at that power spectrum and we set a water level, phi, uh, if any measurements whose, uh, uh, in any parts of the spectrum that fall below the water level, we suppress, we don't transmit those on, and those that fall above the water level, we, we pass on without distortion. Okay, and then the, the, the uh, uh, intuition here is that the, the intermittent things, even though they're locally high uh, power, uh, they, they actually uh, overall, because the low duty cycle are low power, so we're really suppressing those intermittent things when we suppress the low power uh, parts of the spectrum. Okay. And of course we can, the, the, the efficient frontier is traversed if we move the water level up and down. So lower water level means more utility, less privacy, and vice versa. Okay, so that's a source coding approach. Uh, I promised a, co uh, a control approach to this problem, so I'm going to focus more on that in this part of the talk. Um, and this is a, 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 a sort of a different formulation of the same problem, but you'll see why control enters this problem as soon as I set it up. So this is the, the paper I mentioned that appeared in, this, in the JSAC uh, Smart Grid, Grid Communication Series. Okay, so now let's suppose we have, in addition to a smart meter, we have uh, two other things. We have, first of all, we have uh, loads, so that's what we had before, the appliances and so forth. We have a utility provider, here's a meter. Uh, but we also have an energy harvester, so that's something like uh, a wind turbine or a solar array. And we have a battery, okay? So we have two things that we can, uh, we have one thing that we can tr control, uh, the battery, and another thing that injects additional energy into the system. So it would be interesting if we had either one of these, but the control aspects come from the fact that we have a battery. Okay. So, um, so just to set this up, this problem up, sort of uh, as a problem we can get to uh, analytically, uh, let's, let's, let's set it up in a very simple way. So at each time i, just so we discretize time, uh, we have uh, xi, which is the energy demand of the appliances, and we're going to let this be IID binary, 
totally unrealistic, but it allows us to get at some answers. Uh, YI is the energy taken from the uh, utility provider. This is where information uh, privacy leakage happens. Uh, we have harvested energy. We're also going to assume that's IID binary and independent of the load. We have a battery state, which we'll assume to be bounded by one here. In this case, I'm going to talk about larger battery later. Uh, and so the meter is going to read and report YI. So it's not going to be any suppression of information once uh, we draw energy from the utility. It's going to go straight there. Okay. Uh, and the way what we have this energy management unit in the middle, which is essentially a stochastic control, which takes the, the current load, the current harvested energy, and the battery uh, state from the last time, which is what energy is in there at this time, uh, and maps it to a new output load and a new battery state. Okay, and of course there are constraints because we can't, we have to draw at least as much energy, uh, we can't draw more energy than exists in this whole system, right? So that's the constraint. All right, well, uh, what, do we want, what do we want to trade off? Well here, we, 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 first of all, privacy, we want to um, uh, measure it again by information leakage. I'm not going to look at equivocation specifically here, but rather mutual information between the load and what's re what is revealed to the meter. Okay, so that's the information leakage here. And then we're going to trade that off against wasted energy. So, because we're going to use the resources we have to uh, Tra to minimize information leakage, but we don't want to do that in a way that w just wastes energy. Okay, so that's the trade-off: wasted energy rate versus information leakage. Uh, and it's a stochastic control. We want to choose based on the uh, current load, the current harvested energy, and the previous battery state. We want to choose a probability distribution on the amount of energy we draw from the um, from the utility provider. Well, this is all, everything's binary, okay? It's a big uh, uh, Markov chain, okay? And the transition probabilities here, every, remember everything is binary basically, the transition probabilities here are gonna determine the various battery states uh, and it's gonna determine when energy is wasted and so forth, okay? So because we've assumed everything is binary IID, we have a reasonably manageable uh, problem. Unfortunately, we can't solve this problem analytically, okay, but we can solve it numerically because it's small, okay, uh, and when we do that, so that's the problem, the battery introduces memory, it's very hard to get closed form expressions, but we can solve things numerically, this is, uh, there's a way of computing the mutual information uh, numerically, uh, Andy Lolliger developed that, we can use that and just enumerate all the, through the space of transition probabilities that we can choose until we find the efficient frontier, and there it is. Okay, so this is for the case, particular case where uh, the, the, the two, the, the energy harvester and the load are both uh, Bernoulli with prob you know, transition pro uh, probability one half, success probability one half. Okay, so there it is. All right, um, it's not very elegant, but it's, it's one way of doing it. Of course, if you allow the states to be more than binary, this gets harder and harder and harder and harder numerically, okay? So at some point, maybe you want it to be continuous and then try to solve it in a continuous manner. Uh, well, uh, just to show you the effect of the battery, uh, this shows, uh, first of all, this again, the load is by, uh, IID Bernoulli with success probability a half. This shows the uh, information, minimum e information leakage rate, meaning at that frontier, and this shows the wasted energy rate again at that frontier versus the energy harvesting rate going from zero to one. So this is the rate at which the, the solar array produces energy, basically. And the two lines here are the system with, with, with energy harving and har harvesting in blue and without energy harvesting in red, and you can see the effect here of the energy harvester. Of course, once the, uh, I'm sorry, without a battery, excuse me, this is with and without a battery, and here you can see the effect of the energy harvester. Of course, once you're harvesting energy all the time, you don't need a battery, and so it doesn't matter, okay? 
you don't leak any information because you don't need to draw anything from the, the grid. Uh, and this shows the uh, wasted energy versus uh, for the same parameters, okay, versus energy harvesting rate with and without a battery. Uh, and you can see the battery has less uh, uh, influence on wasted energy. And of course, again, once the energy harvesting rate is one, you're in, you're going to waste half the energy, right? Because you're only the load is binary uh, with probability uh, drawing load with probability a half. We can also look at what happens without energy harvesting to look at the effect of the battery capacity. Uh, so on the left here, this shows the uh, minimum information leakage rate in that case uh, versus battery capacity. And of course you can see, and this is with equal probable load again, there's no energy harvesting. Uh, and you can see that as the battery capacity goes up, of course we uh, le leak less and less information because we can just keep putting energy in the battery and using that. Uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, we, we could smooth out the uh, use of energy. Uh, here's the same thing, uh, here's the trade-off we had before for the same situation, uh, information leakage rate versus wasted power. Now we allow wasted power from the grid. I should have said that before, we didn't allow that in the earlier formalism. Um, and for, for different battery capacity, so this is a little messy because again this is all done numerically. This just shows that efficient frontier and you can see that as we increase the battery capacity it gets easier to trade off. Uh, it gets easier to be private I guess is the right way to say it. Okay so, let, so that's a, a way of an injecting control into this problem uh, and I'll just uh, let me summarize that uh, this, this briefly and then I'll move on to another problem. Uh, so I really looked at two problems here, so there's a little information here too. Uh, source coding at the meter, where we saw reverse water filling. Again, we get sort of a classical information theoretic solution there uh, as a way of trade, optimally trading off uh, privacy and utility. Uh, and also we, we, we looked at the, the introduction of control here by adding storage to the situation that we can control, okay? And that allows us to, to do other things uh, to trade off privacy and utility. I'll just also point out another paper that just appeared a few days ago uh, in the transactions on smart grid. Uh, this is uh, Junshan Zhang at Arizona State, who, um, not a former postdoc of mine, but this is Wei Yang, who is <laughs> uh, one of Jun, Jun Shan's former students and another student uh, of Jun Shang's here. Uh, and here we, look, we sort of generalize this problem. We look at adaptive control. We do look at continuous state, okay? Uh, adapting to not only the load, but also to pricing, okay? We assume now that the price, in the previous example, we didn't, we didn't assume that there was going to be any price variations. Now we assume that the utility is using the meter data for price uh, variation and we uh, jointly consider privacy and cost now. So it introduces another, another variable. Here we measure privacy by uh, in terms of the variance of the uh, load from the average load. Okay, so if your average load is always the same, uh, there's no, no, you're completely private, right? So the lower that variance is, the more private you are. Yeah, Muriel. So when you do the source coding with the reverse water filling, if you had several databases, do you think you could use, like, remember the water filling that came out of search and reduce group? Right, yeah. These for, for Steppenwolf? Yes. Do you something similar? Uh, that's a good point. I hadn't thought about that, but that would be an interesting problem. Probably yes, is my guess. So, um, so what would what would be the application? So you would have multiple meters right, or uh, correlated somehow. Area, yeah. yeah. So p everybody uh, in an area uh, somehow has correlated behavior. Right. And uh, yeah. So that. Because yeah. they could find out from the other. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So there's there's another aspect right away to that problem, which is um, I learned this from. Uh, uh, Ram Rajagopal, I don't know if you know him at, at Stanford, he's a civil engineering uh, professor, but he came out of um, uh, Praveen Varaya's group, so he's a, really a double E. Um, he he's, uh, works with PG&E, the, the Northern California utility, 
uh, and they have, they, he, he discovered that, uh, maybe he didn't discover it, but he analyzed uh, this, that there are different types of people who have different power use profiles. And you can tell whether some, you know, something about somebody's socioeconomic status by, by, by looking at the power usage. Terry is uh, shaking his head, so uh, nodding about that. So, we can, for example, if you can imagine, I mean, I was immediately thinking when you said that, that you, if you see the size of the spike, yeah. You can see what kind of TV they have. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So, so what I was thinking about in, in the context of Muriel's question was, well, in a neighborhood, probably most people have the same socioeconomic status, roughly. So somehow there is correlation between when they get up in the morning and what they do in the evening and so forth. So you do have correlated meters, and so that's a very interesting, a very interesting problem. And, and probably you're right, that work by Sergio would, would be relevant there. So. Yeah, interesting. Okay, so let me um, let me talk about one other thing, and I have ten minutes, so I'll try to be be brief. Um, so this is a, a problem of competitive privacy, and I'm just going to motivate it using um, Smart Grid. I don't know if it only comes up in Smart Grid, or even if it really is a Smart Grid problem, but it can be motivated using Smart Grid. Uh, and this is work that first appeared, uh, the ideas that first appeared in this paper. This is Lalitha again, and this is Shomo. Uh, and uh, this was at Asilomar, uh, uh, two, two Asilomars ago, I guess three Asilomars ago now. Uh, and then this is a more recent work with Veronica and Lalitha, which is still in, in preprint form. Um, so let me uh, motivate the problem. So the, the, this, this is one way to motivate it, although the problem I'm going to look at is a very pristine version of this problem. Still, I don't think there are any more epsilons, by the way. I'm just thinking here. Um, the, uh, so you know, the North American grid is uh, managed by these so-called RTOs, regional transmission organizations. Uh, I noticed that Florida is not part of this, so this is probably the southern companies here. They do their own thing. Finally, now SPP Southern Power uh, now a is now one. So okay, so this is I need to update Florida, my Florida picture. Out of it. Yeah, Florida's still out of yeah. it. Yeah, well, Texas goes its own way too. Yeah. You know. um, but New Jersey doesn't. This is mine. PJM, uh, Pennsylvania, Jersey, and Maryland, which you can see also extends all the way to Chicago. Uh, but basically, these these uh, organizations are predicting the load and, and deciding what resources are needed to meet the load. And that's, that's basically their job. Um, so one of the things they need to do is to do state estimation in the grid. Okay? And uh, to, to, make, to do reliable state estimation, of course, they need to exchange information because the grid is interconnected. Right? Uh, so that's the utility of sharing information among these RTOs. On the other hand, there's a lot of private companies in there, so there's private information. So for reason of economic competitiveness, they might like to withhold information from one another. Okay, so, so now there's a utility privacy trade-off here, but it's in a competitive setting, right? So this is a problem of competitive privacy. Okay, so this is the, the setting. It's probably not exactly the problem these people have every day, but this just gives you a motivation for the problem I'm going to look at. So uh, how can we model that? Well, we can think about um, a simple model where every, the, each state is just a, a, a one vector, one real number. So the nth RTO has a state. Uh, and it, the kth RTO uh, uh, measures some linear combination of those states plus noise. OK, so it's a, it's a linear measurement model or multiple access channel or whatever, however you want to look at it. Okay. And uh, of course cooperation is going to lead to inevitable leakage of state information. That is if, if, if RTOK shares YK with other people, other uh, RTOs, there's going to be leakage of its own state information. Okay. Uh, so the utility for RTOK is of course going to be the mean squared error in estimating its own state. Uh, while privacy for RTOK is going to be leakage of information about its own state to other RTOs. Okay, and of course they already know something about its state because of this linear model. All right, so that's the, that's the setup. Uh, we can look specifically at the two agent case. Uh, so we have uh, just two computer, competing agents in this case. We can assume that each RTO has n IID observations. So now we just have uh, 
really two parameters, alpha and beta, plus noise variance. Uh, and so these are the, the measurements. Uh, we assume that the states uh, are normal, uh, the noise is normal, Gaussian, all independent. So a very simple statistical model. Uh, we want to trade off two parameters. One is the, so for agent J, agent J would like to minimize the average mean squared error in estimating its own state over time. Uh, and the other that wants to trade that off with another parameter, which is information leakage. So the information leakage for agent J is just the mutual information between uh, agent J's states, the opposing agent's measurements, and whatever information agent J releases to the, the, the opposing agent. So we'll call that J sub J. I guess bad notation, J sub J. But this is whatever information is transmitted from agent J to its counterpart. Okay. So that, what, those are the trade-off parameters. We'd like, agent J would like, this sounds like a secret agent, doesn't it, agent J? Agent J would like this to be small and this to be small at the same time. And you can sort of see what's going to happen here. First of all, it's a linear model, you know, correlated sources. We're trying to minimize a sort of rate, right, and a distortion. So this is really a Weiner-Ziv problem. So the, the optimal way to exchange information if you must, is through weiner ziv coding. That is, that's the most efficient way of trading information in the sense that it maximizes privacy, that is, minimizes L1 and L2 for any desired fixed distortion D1 and D2. Okay, so that's the, wherever the efficient frontier is, that's how you're going to implement it, weiner ziv coding. The problem you can see here, though, is that the, distort, the leakage of, of J uh, that depends on the distortion of its counterpart, right? Not on its own distortion. So how should the agents behave here? Uh, if they give information to their counterpart, it only helps the counterpart, it doesn't help them, unless there's a quid pro quo. Okay, so you can see that this is a problem for game theory. Okay, and that's what's uh, in this paper with Veronica and Lalitha. <clears throat> okay, so let me just say a little bit about that and then I'll wrap up. Okay, so first of all, an observation. Everything's Gaussian IID here. So if we look at uh, rate and leakage uh, versus distortion, they're monotone, okay? So we can in fact think about the action of a given user uh, or, or of a given agent as being in, in terms of how much distortion it inflicts on its counterpart agent, okay? So when we set up a game, uh, we'll think of the a action of agent uh, J, A sub J, to be the distortion caused at its counterpart agent. And that, we have, we're going to say that maximally has to be some amount D bar, okay, because uh, if not, then there's, we're, the game's over, okay. If we can inflict any amount of distortion on the other agent, game's over, okay. So, um, so that's how we play the game. We inflict, but we do that, of course, by releasing information to the other uh, agent. But basically, in the bottom line, it comes down to inflicting a certain amount of distortion, or um, having a certain, uh, allowing a certain amount of distortion is a better way to say it. So, Agent J gets a payoff, uh, in, in, which depends on his own action and the action of the other agent. Uh, it's a negative. It's affected negatively by information. Uh, leakage, that is high leakage is a uh, low payoff, uh, and the deviation, uh, and, and also by, in terms of the deviation from its maximum uh, allowable distortion and the amount inflicted on it by um, its counterpart agent, that is opposing agent, uh, in a logarithmic form. So this is a way to set up a utility for this game, and there are two weights. WJ and WJ prime, which uh, balance the two. Uh, well, it turns out that this problem is a pr classical prisoner's dilemma, as you might have guessed from the formulation. That is, there's no incentive to do anything other than inf uh, 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 share whatever minimal amount of information you have to to make to achieve the maximal possible distortion. Okay, so this is a, a game, an easy, the easiest game in the world to solve because it's a classical prisoner's dilemma. So one way to deal with that is to add pricing. So if you start, if you add to that, add to the utility 
uh, a penalty, if you will, or a price for distortion at the other user, then you can, of course, uh, when you play this game, you can incentivize any behavior, okay, just by choosing the prices. So it's not, not interesting. Yeah, Muriel. So the assumption of Gaussian noise, is that, is that still a pen? Pessimum noise as the usual thing, so it's kind of lower in your, in your, because you have like a rate distortion curve, right? Right. That's the lowest uh, uh, rate that you would have for that distortion? Um, well, I, the, the only Not thing, I mean, the, certainly the Gaussian noise gives us this curve, right? But I mean, I, we would get a similar curve, I guess. For, as long as the noise is IID, we'd still get a similar curve, right? Yeah, yeah. I was wondering if you know that the Gaussian is worse, you know, like, that, that, I mean, that's very often why we assume Gaussian. Oh, oh, I see, yeah. Energy, Got it. It's the most conservative estimate. Yes, uh -huh, okay, good, good point. It sort of yes. minimizes the rate. Uh, I, I, would, I, would, my, I would speculate, yes, that the answer is yes. Yeah, I mean, I, we, I didn't, it's not something we prove, but I, I would guess that that answers that yes. Yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, so anyway, price, uh, pricing does what you would expect. Um, uh, so why don't we look at a multi-stage game? So then we can think about, well, what we do today might affect what we do, what happens tomorrow, okay? What we do, what we do to our counterpart today might aff affect what our counterpart does to us tomorrow, okay? So we can look at a T-stage game uh, where we have a um, uh, forgetting factor row. Uh, and just average, look at total utility over T stages. Uh, so we play this game in multiple stages, and as long as T is finite, this is still a uh, prisoner's dilemma. Okay, we can't really, we still don't get any uh, help from our counterpart except what uh, is uh, demanded. Okay. On the other hand, if T is infinite, uh, as often happens in multi-party games, we get something different, okay? And in fact, when we have an infinite game, that is, if, we're gonna, if we know we're gonna play this game forever, um, we can actually, other, other behaviors become Nash equilibria, okay? Depending on the uh, forgetting factor row, okay? So as long as, uh, th th basically any equilibrium that satisfies this particular property, uh, so these are the, this is the equilibrium point, and this is the maximal point, and this is the utility function, uh, for both J's uh, is a, uh, a Nash equilibrium, okay? And uh, we can see what that is. It's this complex numerical, a uh, complex formula for the values of rho and, and so forth with all the parameters. But basically, you can see that uh, these are, here's the maximal distortion. Uh, these are the two uh, distortions. Uh, these are the equilibrium distortions. And depending on rho, you get different uh, non-trivial equilibria, okay? Uh, another way to uh, get away from prisoner's dilemma is a common goal game. That is to, to, to say, okay, we're in it together and we're gonna have a common goal. And this is just a utility function that enforces a common goal. You can see this is now we have the two um, it, it, uh, leakages together and we have a parameter Q and then we have something that looks at joint distortion. Uh, and here, uh, we also get, this enables cooperation, of course, it's a common goal game, and uh, we get uh, uh, different equilibria, non-trivial, depending on the value of Q. And again, there's a complicated formula for what Q, for what, what, what you, uh, equilibria you can get in terms of Q. Okay, so uh, I almost brought us in on time. Uh, so just summarizing this part, here's a, uh, adding an additional dimension to the privacy utility trade-off here. When we have competing agents, who also, each with its own uh, uh, utility privacy trade-off, uh, whose trade-off is affected by what the other agents do, uh, we saw that, just briefly, Weiner-Ziv coding gives optimal information exchange. It's not, not that surprising given the model setup. Uh, and then we looked at uh, wh what do you do, how do you decide what how much information to exchange. You know how to, ex how to exchange it, but don't know how much to exchange. And for that, we can introduce game theoretic uh, ideas. The one-shot and finite multi-stage games are basically prisoner's dilemma problems. Uh, if we have an infinite multi-stage game, we get more interesting behavior. And of course, common goal games also give us uh, more interesting behavior. So just to wrap up. 
uh, motivated the privacy utility trade-off. It's a more general problem than smart grid, but I wanted to talk mainly about smart grid in this context. Uh, for the general formalism, we introduced some information theoretic ideas. Uh, for smart metering, uh, for the privacy utility trade-off there, we also looked at some information theoretic ideas briefly, the source coding approach, and then we also in injected control into the problem by adding uh, storage. Uh, and then finally, we introduced this idea of competition uh, in which game theory comes up naturally. Okay. So the bottom line, uh, information control and game theoretic ideas uh, are interesting for looking at the fundamentals of privacy and smart grid problems. And with that, um, these are the references. I guess I'll leave that up and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's a great question. It also comes up in information theoretic secrecy, where you know rather than looking at average uh, uh, equivocation, you want to look at um, uh, total equivocation, right? So um, the, the, the I mean the the, the bottom line answer is it, it isn't a perfect. Uh, a measure of privacy or secrecy, right? Because you could have uh, the rate could be zero, and for short some bursty period of time, you could be giving away all your secrets, right? So definitely total uh, rather than rate total amount of information exchange is is uh, better. I think you get insights, you know, in, in things like the wiretap channel, you get more or less the same results whether you look at uh, average or total. Uh, equivocation. Uh, I don't know about this problem. It's an interesting question whether you do or not, but it's a, it's a great question. And of course, another way to look at privacy uh, would be in terms of distor use distortion there as well instead of uh, uh, mutual information, right? And so that would also be, of course, you, then you have the question of average distortion or total distortion. But, but that also is something where machinery does exist coming from, again, information theoretic uh, secrecy. But that's a, that's a great question. That's a, some interesting problems in there, I think. So, any other uh, questions? Yeah, Sean. Comment. De definitely the, uh, what you call the, um, the shared goal, the last... Uh, the competitive privacy. Yeah, that's, well, in that case, where there's a shared goal in mind. Oh, yeah, the very last thing, common goal, yeah. Definitely that's what they, they would prefer. Sure. Because they want to make money off each other, but more than anything, they need each other. You know, they, they, uh, yeah, and, you, and a regulatory, I mean, uh, of course, how do you enforce a utility function, right? Well, the either, the, either the market does it, which would be the competitive one, or the regulators do it, which would be the... But you've got two CEOs who lose their job if there's any, yeah. any kind of problem. Yeah. Yeah. So they need each other. Oh, they so, each other. so we can introduce the CEO problem into this. <laughs> 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 yeah, you're real. distortion, um, so often the statistics really make it more or less, I mean, we know how to do the rate distortion curve for Gaussian binary and, you know, right. a couple of others. Do we have some idea of the statistics or of the sources in this case, the databases? Or, uh, or, okay, can you do like you did, do you took Andy's approach to estimating and, and, and using it that way, does that work? Or? Well, um, it, it, yeah, no, no, I know. I, I was just thinking, well, I mean, certainly for categorical data, um, it's not hard to, uh, which is like binary, I guess, right? I mean, binary scaled up. Um, it's not hard to get real solutions in that formalism. Uh, if you get away from, from Gaussian, of course, you know, with continuous, it's very hard to, to get real closed form solutions. You know, there's a lot of data, uh, smart meter data and stuff out there, so I haven't, I haven't really seen, maybe someone here has seen that, but I haven't seen, you know, est you know, statistical estimation of what it's like. I doubt if it's really Gaussian, right? But, um, you know, it's like, it's what we do, right? We assume Gaussian, but um, it's, it's probably not Gaussian, or, or even hidden, I mean, hidden state, uh, it, it's really what we're assuming here in that case is, uh, 
uh, basically a mixture model, right? So it may be reasonably modeled by a mixture model, but but I really just I really just don't know. Yeah, it'd be good. it'd be interesting to to look at some data and get an idea of what the statistics are. So okay, yeah. I guess one of the points of this uh, demand-based pricing is to distort the user's behavior, to alter his behavior if you can expose it to a more, either directly or through like smart devices in the home to decide, oh, I'm not going to run my refrigerator right. or my pool pump at this time. Uh, so have you thought about how that feeds back into the privacy? Because that sort of should smooth the load across yeah. the utility, right, is the intention. It it's a little bit like it's a little bit like the problem with a battery, right? You're just right. you know so you you know you're sort of so if you have a electric car in your garage, it's w one way of doing that rather it would be just to smooth draw energy out of the electric battery uh, the car the electric car battery. But you're right, it's it's a, it becomes a dynamical system, right? Where the there are controls on the uh, the loads as well. And, and the answer is no, we haven't thought about it. I mean, we've thought about it, but we haven't done anything about it. But you're right. Certainly the real problems are much more complicated. So, but um, yeah, that's another way to inject control into the, uh, into the formulism. So, I get Mike. In, in the smart meter problem? Well, the utility company is the adversary, right? It's like you don't want to give your information to Facebook, right? So, you, but you want to be on Facebook, right? So it's the same with the utility. You want to give your information to the utility because you want to save money, but, you know, you, maybe you don't trust the utility as much as you trust your, your sister, right? So. Well, I think maybe just to comment to that, it's not just you don't trust the utility. It's also if all of this is online, you don't want somebody to hack uh, in, monitor them um, yeah. when you're not home, or right. for for security in your not data security but physical security. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, okay, coffee break. Thank you all. Thank you.